I've had a couple of veterinarians that struggle with the way that I practice, right? And they're because the gold standard is to check out values. And I'm like, listen, I know this cat's a kidney failure. I know this dog's got liver issues, but I don't want him feeling crappy. I want him to feel good. And, and even if that means I, I take away some days from their lifespan, I know that their you know health span was better. And that's what's most important. You know, end of life, the, like my, my world with hospice, it's not about prolonging suffering. I, I want to make sure that they live well until they pass. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps pet parents understand and optimize the health of their furry family so they can live the full and happy life you want for them. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Call the Vet Show. So I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. I'm your host here and I'm really pleased to be meeting you if this is the first time that you're listening to the show. For those of you who are regular listeners, welcome back. I've got an absolute treat for you today where we consider kind of philosophy of treatment, I guess, but also the importance of treating our senior pets and giving them what they really need in their last few weeks, months or even years. And this treatment philosophy, if you like, is something that I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about, um, in a way wrestling with, although I kind of am very clear in my own mind of what I believe is, is best for our pets. But that's different for every individual. And there is a whole spectrum of different care that the veterinary industry, if you like, can provide. So I think that that is a really important consideration. But I also think that we don't want to just disregard our responsibility to our senior dogs and cats after a lifetime of companionship and joy. And joining me today, I've got Dr. Mary Gardner, and I couldn't think of a better person to be discussing this conversation with me. Dr. Mary, as you're here, deals with nothing but senior pets with hospice care and with end of life care. So she has been there, done that, seen it all and really talks passionately about all of the different things we need to think about for our senior pets. So even if your dog or cat isn't there yet, even if they're younger, These topics are definitely something that you should spend some time thinking about so that when the time comes to be making some sometimes very difficult, very challenging decisions, you'll have already had time to think of them ahead of time and you'll already be sure in your mind of the steps that you want to take and the best thing for you, your family and your pet. Just before we start, though, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button on your podcasting app so that you don't miss out on all of my future content, future episodes with expert guests talking about every aspect of pet care that you need to know about. And I'd also encourage you to share this episode with two or three pet owning friends and family members so that their pets can benefit from the huge amount of information that Dr. Mary brings to our discussion. Here's this episode's expert interview. Dr. Mary, welcome along to the show. I'm really pleased to be talking to you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'd love, before we dive into the kind of the juicy topic of old pets, if you'd like, I'd love to know just a little bit of your background. Like, how did you find yourself in the world of kind of geriatric medicine and end of life care? Um, Because it's not an obvious direction, I guess, for a lot of vets and what a lot of pet parents think would be enjoyable. No, not not at all. Well, it I really should start before becoming a vet because I didn't grow up thinking that that was going to be my path. I was I was actually in computer software for about a decade before I became a vet. So I'm what they call the second career, uh, you know, in my mid 30s or early 30s I decided to to leave that job and and go to vet school, but the reason that was because of of the death of my own dog. So that really just changed my perspective of of life and what I, you know, what I wanted to do. And so at 35, I graduated vet school and I started to do general general practice, but um, uh, my classmate, Dr. Danny McVitie was doing emergency work and emergency veterinarians see a lot of euthanasia. And she was starting to do in-home euthanasia and hospice care Uh, on the side. And so she, she was doing that for about a year and she, and, you know, I was talking to her about thinking about getting out of general practice. It just wasn't the, you know, fulfillment for me. So she's like, Hey, let's, you know, you want to get in this together and and expand it. So at first I thought that was, sounds really depressing. Like everybody can imagine doing 
euthanasia every day and helping families. But I realized that the death of my own dog is what is what changed my life. And if I can help a family um, make it a little bit better, then I've come full circle. So that's uh, Alex, almost 12 years now. And so we have a company called Lap of Love here in the United States. And, and uh, in a few months, we'll be at almost 300 veterinarians across the country. And so it was just her and I a dozen years ago, and then it's, it's growing. But it's, it is actually very fulfilling to help a family during the hardest day and make it a little bit better. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess I don't want to dwell on the euthanasia aspect for for things. That's not what we're talking about today. But I mean, I'd completely agree. I think it's actually a big honor and a privilege. And when everything goes, you know, nice and smoothly and you know the clients, you've had that relationship with them. I think that's it makes it more fulfilling for for me personally as a vet, but also I think it makes it easier to deal with and a more gentle process for the pet parent as well. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. And you know, we're, we're seeing very sick animals, very sick and old animals, and it's, it is relieving them from their struggles. And there's a, a bit of, you know, anxiety that, that is removed once they're passed from, from owners. They're like, oh, okay, he's not struggling anymore. And, and, you know, they're, they feel like they're at peace and it's, it's sometimes helpful with the grief to make it as good as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing how often there's actually laughs and things that go on in that, you know, in that consultation yeah. as you share memories of, of, you know, the, the, the cat as a wee little palm sized kitten <laughs> or, you know, the dog doing right. something goofy. It's yeah. It's not all, all, all depressing and tears. No. Um, and also I guess it's not a failure, is it of treatment or a failure of care? Cause that's what can also, you know, drive people's negative feelings. Yes. Uh, you know, and I'm glad that you mentioned the, fa- the failure of care, because I think so many people say, you know, euthanasia is not a failure of medicine or us, but uh, there comes a point where it's, it's very difficult to, to manage a, a, you know, aging pet, dog or cat, two pounds or 200 pounds. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And, and sometimes we get so into it as caregivers and we kind of have, I say, denial goggles because you're just so into it that to set, step back and see really what's going on. And, and it's not that you didn't care enough and you'd probably do it for another 20 years, but it's, I always say we only borrow them for a little bit. We got to give them back. That's a lovely sentiment and not, yeah, not one I've heard before. That kind of brings us round to the fact, and, and this is what kind of a, a fascinating statistic and one that didn't really surprise me, but when you see things written in words you think oh yeah other people are seeing the same thing which again is you know it shouldn't be too surprising but over 50 percent of our senior pets in the us and that's going to be the same across the world do not see their vet at all in the year before they die so that's i think when people hear that that's pretty shocking it is and you know i i i when i when i was going into homes i kind of felt that when when owners would you know just share their stories and say you know well he's been, you know, painful for a year, you know, a year and a half or whatever. And, and I could tell, and they've told me that they had not, they're, they're not on any medication or whatever, but I decided that I can't just, you know, have this statistic in my mind, uh, from what I feel, I got to get some real facts, evidence-based. Yeah. And so we evaluated, um, uh, om- almost a half a million pets that were euthanized in the United States. And I'm, re- and I'm redoing it again this year, um, just to see if COVID maybe changes some of that statistic, but it was a half a million pets that we looked what, that we looked at that were euthanized at their at their veterinary clinic, and fifty uh, percent had not been seen by their veterinarian in a year before they pass. So, uh, and six months was higher. It was maybe fifty eight percent had not yeah. seen their vet in, in the last six months. But when you're when you're an you know a double digit pet, that's like you and I not going to our doctor in our eighties and nineties, like ever. And there's so much that we could do. So it it was very sad for me to see that statistic. So why do you think that is? Because, you know, clearly the people that you're dealing with in the lap of love, they're really, you know, their, their pet is their family. They've gone out of their way to make that final passing the the best it can be for, for their pet yeah. and, and for them. So it's not a lack of care. So why, what are the barriers to people reaching out? Why are they feeling right. that they're not able to ask for help or seek help? Well, I think there's a number of reasons, Alex, because uh, I think, but, you know, honestly, it's, it, it is a cost to bring them to the veterinarian and they think, you know, here's my crunchy 19 year old cat. What is Dr. Alex going to tell me that I don't already know? 
you know, it's going to be time. Uh, they may also be scared and we all like to avoid the topic of aging and dying and, and, and they don't want to hear it. So, so it's better to, to kind of like ignore it, if you will. Um, they, uh, you know, back to number one, what are you going to say? They, they may not want to spend $500 on blood work and x-rays to figure out. And that's okay. Also, I want people to know that. And with, with hospice, I actually don't do blood work or x-rays. I'm, I'm making sure they're just comfortable and, to, and, you know, the last few weeks before they pass. And I don't care what their kidney's doing. I just got to make sure that they're not feeling nauseous and, and you know, crappy. So um, I think also a big part, which people don't consider, is that a lot of these pets are also larger. And to get them in the car and they're painful is, is a challenge. And, they're, and they have anxiety and they have dementia. And, you know, they don't want to work them up and bring them into a clinic and, and things like that. So I think there's a number of factors. Um, but I think a big one is, you know, what, what are, what are they going to tell me? What, what is my doctor going to tell me that I don't know? And, and a lot is also at the end is, you know, uh, caregiver support at the home and environmental changes and product recommendations and things like that. It, it isn't always about the medicine, but let me tell you, feeling good and not anxious is a good thing. And we can do that as veterinarians, right? Who wants to feel nauseous or dehydrated or painful? We could we could really help these pets out so much. My thoughts echo that exactly. You know, I think a lot of um, one other thing I wonder, and and maybe it's a subset, is that there's a certain inevitability to old age, and it may be that they're suffering from arthritis and are pretty stiff and sore, and say, oh yeah, my dog's got it as well. So it's just a you know that is that is how we age, and that is an acceptable normal part of age as well. Correct. Right. He's just old. He's lumpy. He's old. He's stinky. He's wobbly. He's skinny. He's, you know, crusty, but it, you know, we would take something if we were feeling bad. Right. And, and also I think a lot of people uh, forget that it's not easy to assess pain and discomfort in a chronic condition with dogs or cats. It's when a dog breaks his leg or whatever, something traumatic, an acute situation, you're going to hear them. They're going to scream. They're going to be limping, but you know, they, 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 they're very good at managing their, what they're dealing with. They don't complain, right? I complain over a hangnail and, <laughs> you know, try to get somebody to do my dishes for me. But these guys are like, you know what? I can't get on the, the scratching post anymore. Oh, well, I'm going <laughs> to. Yeah, just, absolutely. Absolutely. You just don't complain. Yeah. I mean, the episode before this, um, I was answering a question and it was about dental care. You know, what do mm -hmm. I do? Because my, my cat stopped eating dry food and not and but they're eating wet food it's like well you know if we're waiting until they stop eating as our marker that they're in pain that's when they're choosing yeah. to die so they just get on with they get on with life don't they they really do i mean we can learn so much from our from our pets they're just like okay this hurts i'm going to go down on some mushy food yeah and 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 we don't we're not looking in their mouths and and i think sometimes it's um it's when it becomes an issue for us. So, okay, the mouth stinks or yeah. they stink or they're peeing on our floor or, you know, I can't get them up the stairs. Then we might say, okay, maybe something's different. But a lot of times cats are just laying in sunbeams and not, in, you know, <laughs> saying yeah. anything. That, yeah, that, seemingly that, living the life of Riley when actually there's something pretty serious going on. Yeah, exactly. So with that in mind, I guess what I'm hearing is actually that the relationship with your vet is really important because I'm a big believer as well that, you know, we've got this gold standard medical care, which is fantastic for those that can afford it. But honestly, unless you've got insurance, that's the really tiny subset. So it's my job, I feel, to guide people through what the options are. And yes, mention those gold standards, but work with you, the pet parent, to find out something that is acceptable affordably but also is physically possible to do there's no point giving 20 different tablets to your cat that is going to shred you to pieces if you try and get one down them um or you know talk about carrying your dog up the stairs when they're a 50 kilogram labrador um you know that's that's my job so my message would don't be shy you know go and talk to your vet there's actually loads of different things that we can do across a whole spectrum a hundred a hundred percent you know i always say there's there's actually four budgets in life and 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 uh, just as a in, in, an interesting point, in the United States, only 2% of the pet families have insurance for their pet. So it's very different in the United Kingdom and probably where you are too. It's yeah, it's about the same here, actually. It's, it's, it went to us from a stage where 10, 12 years ago, no one really had heard of insurance or they'd look at you as though you're crazy. Whereas now 
people have heard of it and they think about it. They don't necessarily take it up, but it's, we're getting there. I wish, I wish it was more in the 50%, right? Like that would be really good. But so there are four budgets in life and this isn't just taking care of your pets. It's everything, right? And so the number one budget is of course the monetary budget. So can I afford to take care of my pet? And some, yes, some medications, some treatments are expensive. I, I had a Doberman that had heart failure and a lot of other stuff, and it was $400 a month for his meds. Not everybody could do that. I, I don't have children. So he was it. And, and I cannot judge a family that can't afford $50 and, you know, or, or whatever the comparative is. So the monetary budget's one budget, but, but we have to remember there are three other ones and they're really important too. And that is that you have a physical budget. So can you pick up that 50 kilogram dog? Can you pick up that cat that's going to scratch your eyes out if you go near it? And because he doesn't, you know, he's an honorary old bugger and he doesn't <laughs> want you near him and we love him. But so there's a physical aspect. Do you have stairs that you have to manage? And, and that's just a struggle. Uh, there's the time budget. It, it takes a lot of time. And for, for my dog, he was, like I said, he was in heart failure and every four hours he needed to be let out to go to the bathroom. And I don't have a job where I could be home every four hours. So now I would come home to a big pee puddle and some other stuff. And then we hit the fourth budget, which is the emotional budget. It, it was a lot of stress in my family. We had a lot of arguments. I was, I wanted to continue to do stuff because not that I want pee all over my house, but because I could manage it really well. So at any time, if any one of those budgets is up for a family, then, then I, I support their decision to say goodbye. But what they need is education. And that's where, like, I, I'm a big proponent of educating them. And, oh my gosh, he is, he, he, you can't get him up the stairs. Well, let me tell you the best harness to use. Let me tell you the booties that are the best. Let me give you some tips on fecal incontinence and, and things that the caregivers struggle with. And we have that. We just, you know, sometimes we're, we're focused so much on the medicine part of stuff that we forget about talking about the diaper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, the pet parents who are coming to us, they don't maybe expect us to talk about or to consider all those things. But I guess the message there is that we aren't, we're, we're, we're focused on your pet as a whole and the family as a whole, rather than that particular joint that hurts or that organ that isn't working. It's correct. It, it's your vet's job to work with you. Yeah. And tell us like, Hey, I have tile floor and he's slipping. What, what's the best product? Because we don't know. We're not in your house. And, and the other thing, too, is I, what it's so important as a veterinarian uh, is to ask, what is the biggest struggle that you have? And I want families to tell us, because if we go in, Alex, and we look at these ugly teeth and we're like, oh, my gosh, that's a hot garbage mess express. Right. And we want it. We need to pull some teeth. We need to do cleaning. We know we can fix this mouth. However, that dog is sitting at the edge of the bed, panting and pacing the entire night and keeping that family up. They're not going to, they don't care about the teeth. They care about the cognitive dysfunction that's happening. Yeah. So it's, it's really important for families to just be open and honest and say, I can't handle this. Help me with that. We could, we could probably get them feeling better and doing better. And then we can mess with the hot garbage breath. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't feel that you're going to be judged because- You've come to us to, for help and that's what we're here for. And it doesn't matter what that problem is. And, and yep. don't feel like we're judging you for not having, you know, $20,000 to spend on those total hip replacements or whatever it is. Like that's, that's not right. where we're at because you're, because a lot of us would struggle to afford some of that top level care as well, if we weren't insured. So 100%. it's, it's the reality of life that we live in. And it's something that I'm very passionate about because I hear a lot about all of the gold standard stuff. And I mean, we work, I work in an area where we don't have a load of referral options and things. So that, that cutting edge chemo and stuff often isn't an option anyway, but there are other things that we can do. There are other ways we can manage to ensure the quality of life, which is really Yes. key towards the end of life. And I loved what you were saying earlier about, you know, not wanting bloods and all that kind of thing, because if you know, if you've had that discussion and we need to have that discussion about side effects, and I guess the classic one here is, um, you know, Metacam, a painkiller for cats, um, which is relatively controversial as far as I can make out in the US with regards long-term <laughs> care, but, you know, it's pretty common over here and in the UK. If we know a cat is not going to be able to survive in comfort without it, Right. Then to a certain extent, who cares if their kidneys are knocked out, if they're happy for that last week, month, whatever it is. Exactly. Exactly. I've, I've had a couple of veterinarians that struggle with the way that I practice. Right. And they're because the gold standard is to check out values. And I'm like, listen, I know this cat's in kidney failure. I know this dog's got liver issues, 
but I don't want him feeling crappy. I want him to feel good. And, and even if that means I, I take away some days from their lifespan, I know that their you know, health span was better. And that's what's most important. You know, end of life, the, like my, my world with hospice, it's not about prolonging suffering. I, I want to make sure that they live well until they pass. And, and sometimes I'm giving things that over three years might be a problem, but over three months, it's not. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I feel very strongly about. It's, it's really important. With that, so let's switch the conversation to how people know that there's something that their pet needs help with so that so that we we could intervene in those earlier stages rather than waiting until that mouth is a hot mess or or the dog can't get up at all um, let alone climb the stairs you're right so i think i i have i've created like a geriatric dog and cat checklist because there's so many things that that are are small and subtle that they may not realize like a change in the in the bark of a dog that's not normal he's not just getting old that could be as, you know, maybe laryngeal paralysis or some other stuff, right? So really give, keeping a good journal about the subtle changes that, that you see. I, I, am, I am impressed, <laughs> not in a good way, actually, but maybe impressed not the best word, at how many cognitive dysfunction uh, you know, patients that we see. And owners are like, oh, I didn't know that was a big deal. I just thought he was staring at the corner a little bit more. And so, so I think keeping a journal and, uh, and, and really evaluating the, the subtle changes throughout, throughout the pet's life and particularly at the end and, and, and not be shy to bring it up to, to the veterinarian. I mean, listen, if your cat is not peeing in the litter box, there could be, there could be big problems and, or he could literally just have cognitive dysfunction and he doesn't know, and we can, we can, we can help, or he's got arthritis. You know that, uh, you probably know this, but cats are either right or left pod particularly right and it's gender so so i always say you know to, rem, to rem, remind me or make me remember women are always right so uh the right <laughs> <laughs> the right paw is more female so if you if you if that cat's got arthritis in her right paw right she can't cover her you know what she's done in her litter box and so it's uh it's these little things and don't just say oh he's getting old and yes they are however we can we can help them and the sooner we help them, the better. It has been proven that the sooner we get pain relief on, the sooner that we get you know, some nutraceuticals on or even some better diet and stuff like that, they will live better and they will live longer better. It's completely proven. Yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, the journal is, is an excellent thing to do and, and to refer back for weeks, even months, years, because these things, they're, they're such a lot you say and they... St- start gradually over a really long period of time so in the day-to-day when you're seeing your pet every day you really don't notice that change until things are potentially quite extreme right and i love i always say you know take pictures and videos and even for my own dog i she had spinal lymphoma and, and so she was slowly progressively getting worse in her hind and and i looked at a video of her playing with my other dog just like nine months earlier and i'm like wow she was she was different and I'm in it every single day and I'm a veterinarian and I still had my denial goggles on, right? Because that's what love does <laughs> to you. Yeah, it does. You don't want to see it. And yeah, and you're just in the day and you get, you've got the day-to-day grind. You've got your own struggles with whatever as well. And it's, it's understandable. Again, it's, it's, it's normal. So it's not something to think one day, oh my God, my, my pet's really bad. I feel really guilty about that because it happens all, all the time. All the time, yes. The other thing that you mentioned there is that the earlier we get into things, the the, the more comfortable our pets are, or the or the better managed that disease is. I often think a lot of the time, actually, it's cheaper as well in the long run because we're not having to deal with that disaster at the end of things where we have to do all of the things in one go to have any chance. Correct. Yeah, and that's the same across a lot of different conditions. I think a hundred percent, and. And, or we, you know, we avoid crisis sometimes, right? And and it's it's really sad to see the emergency rooms with critical with critical patients that that have not been to their doctor in a while, and they're like, oh, I I didn't know that that was let's say laryngeal paralysis, and I just thought his bark was changing, and he was getting more tired on walks, and now he can't breathe. 
right? Oh, it was just ca- the cat was just coughing. I didn't know what that was. Now they're drowning in their lung fluid b- with heart failure. And, and, and we have to sometimes, if we wait, say goodbye and not the most ideal situation. And that's really sad. I would much rather have, you know, one possible pets at home, uh, you know, surrounded by loved ones. And if that's not available, at least really good at a clinic with, you know, with the, with the celebration of life. Yeah. And with staff members that you know and know you and. Yes. Right. Not the emergency clinic where everybody's in a panic and you need a little, you know, something to help you through it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, personally, I find it much more difficult to have that discussion and to have that successful euthanasia when it's the first time I'm ever meeting that oh. pet, that person. Maybe they're not that they're thinking about euthanasia, but they're not sure, but it really is the right thing to do. It's, it's, it's challenging. It's draining for, for me, but equally the consult's not all about me at all, but it's exactly the same for, for the pet parent and the pet is more anxious because it's an unfamiliar surrounding. Yes. Um, yeah. It's just so bad. I know. Yeah. So I just, I really encourage everybody to go get a consultation with their, with their doctor. And, and, you know, if, if they, if they, if it's, if it's difficult to get your pet to the doctor, Uh, because they're older, that means we've got problems, right? Like if they used to jump in the car before and now it's a struggle, like we've got problems. So it is, uh, and I'd rather get them sooner than later. So that way we can give them, you know, comfort and get them back in, you know, sooner. Cause uh, you know, there's the age, they they age so much faster, let's say than, than we do. We really should be seeing them multiple times a year. And the fact that we don't even see them their last year is just really sad. For those people who are thinking, oh, in in home euthanasia and and maybe um, you know mobile vets, and that's a new concept to them, is that something that is widely available across the US? Is it very specific to areas? Um, what what is that different? The different, I guess, the different treatment options because it's not always the the traditional take your pet to the vet, and that is the only thing that we can do. Right. No, it's, uh, you know, listen, James Harriet was doing in-home stuff for, for a uh, hundred years ago. Right. Uh, not, not for a hundred years, but uh, it, you know, we've, we've specifically been exclusively doing hospice and end of life for, for uh, over 12 years now at, with lap of love, but there are, like you said, mobile veterinarians out there. So if you can't, if your 12 year old Labrador is having struggles, you can absolutely get a mobile vet to come to the house which I think is so much better in some ways too, because we could see the environment. We could see the tile floor. We could see that, Hey, their bed is not in the best position. We could see that their water bowl is, you know, at at a, at a silly spot in the house. They have a a six, six month old dog. That's not going to move over and things like that. So a mobile veterinarian for even general care is, is great. Those that exclusively do end of life, it's definitely a lot more. Um, And for us, they're, they're employees of ours. So we do need a, a bit of a population. It's not in the most rural of areas. So it's a little bit more suburbia and urban areas that we, that we uh, practice because we need that, that um, since we're only doing one thing, we need a certain population, but mobile vets are all over. And even in rural areas, there's mixed animal mobile vets. So they'll, you know, help a goat and help a dog. <laughs> and I think for even your even if it's not an advertised service, if you ask, it may well be something that your vet can accommodate. I know mm-hmm. certainly from my point of view, we, with that, with that final appointment, we, if, if there's the request for the home visit, we, we try our utmost to, to, to do yeah. that. Sometimes we can't, because if it's just me in the clinic and I've got patients coming out my ears, unfortunately, that's not something that we can always do, but most of the time we can. And that, so that, you know, what the other problem is, is that, sorry to throw out a lot of stats, but 75% of people book a euthanasia appointment within 48 hours because no one wants to make this appointment. And I get it. And I understand that. However, if you don't want to be in an emergency situation and you do want to be at home, then you have to plan it. And the sooner they let you, your families let you know, right, Dr. Alex, they're like, Hey, next, next Thursday, can we block this off? And and then you might be able to better accommodate them before better than them calling Thursday morning and asking for you to drop everything and go. So, uh, and you know what, there's, you could always cancel. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And that happens also. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They had, I always say there's the flicker day where they can have a good moment and then, you know, there, everybody wants to cancel, but usually the flame goes out soon after and they're, they're calling back. But, um, so all, all good points. Fantastic. So 
I mean, I guess that brings us around to kind of to, to wrap things up and to talk about your book, because you've written a book that dives into all of the topics that we've spoken about today in a huge amount of more detail and giving pe- parents practical tips. I'd love if you could share a little bit about about that. Well, thank you. It's been three years in the making because because I just was so, <clears throat> so sad for the for the families to not have have had their help for it with their dog or cat. And uh, there's so much, there's so much that, that we can provide the information for. So I, uh, am completed my dog book and it's called, it's never long enough because no matter how long we've had them, it's never long enough. And it's a practical guide for caring for your geriatric dog. And there's four sections. The first section is all about aging and why they age. And, you know, why is it that a Chihuahua lives like twice as long as a great Dane? And are there things that we can do to extend our pet's life? And, and so I, I talk about that. The second section is all about the ailments that a, that a dog has. So it's not necessarily a specific disease, uh, but if you have incontinence, whether it's diabetes or Cushing's or some other reason you have incontinence, how do you manage it in your house? What products are available? And these can be all over the world, these products. Uh, then, then I have a, another section on um, you know, care, caregiver fatigue on journaling on hospice care, things like that goals of care. And then the last section is all about preparing for the end. What is euthanasia and what is natural passing? What does that mean? What does it look like? And also your aftercare options. So if you would prefer, you know, uh, cremation or burial, I go into detail on it, on all of it. It's a big book. It's like what, 500 pages and even about grief and children in grief and ways to celebrate their life and memorial items. So, um, so I, uh, it's been, like I said, three years in the making, a lot of research based on there and the cat book is almost done. So this summer, my cat book will be, will be out. Oh, fantastic. And that is the most beautiful title for a book as well. Um, I, 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 I love it. Um, you've also got a, a children's book as well to help them through that end of life process. I- do thank you. Yes, so a good friend of mine, Colleen Ellis, who's a pet loss pioneer and just a guru in that, and I created it. But we we worked on it over the summer, and we really just wanted a, an activity book that it's not just a coloring book. It it's really a way for the discussions to start with the family. And this could be before or after uh, the dog has died. Again, cat stuff is coming up, but. Um, you know, families, sometimes they don't know what to say, the parents. And so then they're like, well, let's just say that he died and, you know, and send the kid off to school. And uh, so it's really to help bring the family together and have a discussion. So even, even the crossword puzzle says, okay, what are my feelings? Or there's activities. So be a reporter and go and ask all the family members what their favorite thing was about their dog and then write a blog and send it to us or do a, do a vlog. Um, and then, uh, and some, and, you know, some memorial ways to, to, to honor your pet. So what, what to do with their collar afterwards, we have some craft ideas and seed paper. And so it's, a, I have had a lot of adults say like, I don't need a kid to use this book. Because they, they like it, but I think it's, it is a, it is really good for parents as a tool to help, you know, open up the, the very difficult conversations and not make us so death adverse to, to having that conversation. Cause I think, you know, we, we sugarcoat it a lot, don't we? We say, oh, well, he's going to sleep. I have special medicine. He's, you know, going to Rainbow Bridge. We need to say he's dying. And, and this is sometimes the first experience a little human has with, with, with death. And we can do it really well. And I know that may sound weird to some people, but I would much rather have that, that child go through the grief process as normal, but, but also be able to to, to celebrate that pet and, and not be scared about it for the next time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important because I think they've shown as well that if we do it well, actually that experience, a child going through it inc- improves their resilience and their coping ability a, by a, magn- a huge magnitude later in life. Whereas if we say, oh, you know, Oh, he was that the, the, the child thinks the pet was fine. Oh, you know, we took him to the vet and he, and the vet right. killed him. They 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 kind of they don't like us anymore. for the rest of their life. Yeah, correct. Right. It's it's not so good. So that book is called uh, Forever Friend, and uh, it's it, and all of these are on all the you know the major book online bookstores, so on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and and, and stuff like that. So I definitely I made it available where you are. So it's all it's global. Although my you know my my English is U.S. English, so please forgive the lack of use. 
<laughs> I have found myself starting to spell things with US I'm spelling because of the work that I do online and um yeah all yeah. those all the Zs and things at some <laughs> <laughs> exactly so oh, no, we'll just uh, don't, don't hold it against me <laughs> no that's fantastic and I'll leave the links um in in the show notes to everything like that is there anywhere else that you'd like to to send people if they'd like to find out more about you and and the work that you do and your organization right. thank you Yes. So my website is Dr. Mary Gardner. So drmarygardner.com. And I, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. So I post a lot of, uh, and also Pinterest. So I, I post a lot of products or ideas or just things like that. And Lap of Love. So it's lapoflove.com uh, has a lot of content and information also for families. So even, you know, wherever anybody is around the world, they can, they can go there. And something that we also offer is a uh, free pet loss support group. So every a couple times a week, we have a virtual. So anywhere you guys are, uh, you know, might be a little bit different on your hemisphere, but uh, we also offer anticipatory grief and kids and kids in grief um, sessions, and it's all free. So it's a, it's a really good resource because there's not a lot out there that stick around for a while. It's uh, so if we can go, you know, global, there's certainly enough families that need the help. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Mary, thank you so much for the work that you do and for being that advocate for the senior pet is the, the first thing. And, and you know, your role in teaching us vets about how we should be doing things as well. Uh, and thank you so much for spending time with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat. Oh, thanks so much for, for caring about the gray muzzles like I do. Helping your pet live the happy, healthy life they deserve. So there's a huge amount of information there. And I'd love to hear your thoughts after you've spent some time thinking about all of the different aspects of senior pet care that we spoke about what your treatment philosophy and your thoughts of end of life care are and what would be best for your pet i'd love to hear you can check out all of the links and everything mentioned in today's conversation in the show notes over at callthevet.org you can also find me over on instagram at our pets health um, and send me a dm or leave a comment to, to let me know that you've listened to today's episode and let me know what you think Make sure as well that you share this with two or three friends or family members. And until next time, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is the Call the Vet show because they're family. That's it for this episode of the Call the Vet show. Be sure to visit callthevet.org to join the conversation, access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. We'll see you next time.